Hello Kindred Longevity Lifestyle Designers, this is Zach here with Secrets of Longevity.com and it is Q&A on Sunday and one thing I want to mention before getting into the questions is I'm no longer putting music in the background of my videos and that's uh, just because I recently had um, a video of mine get accepted to the YouTube Partnership um, Program and I was looking through all the things to do with what are the qualifications for a video or a channel to get into that program and it seems quite interesting the benefits you can get from it in terms of expanding one's opportunities to be more professional in the videos and also get more coverage on YouTube itself and I noticed obviously that you can't have content in your videos that aren't uh, your own creations your own uh, that don't have your own copyright on it so I'm I do have my own music I might put in some videos if it's necessary but um, I don't think it's too critical and um, I hope it's not too sorely missed. And the video that actually got accepted to the partnership program was uh, the video just from a few weeks ago, the part one of the two-part interview I did with Mark Handy, the uh, low-calorie raw vegan bodybuilder. Now let's get into the questions here. The first one's from Twisted Barney, and they're asking how often I use cannabis sativa, and if not often, have I used it in the past, and in what form? Now, I don't use marijuana at all, but I used to... Uh, when I was more involved in music, I was a musician, I was really striving hard to be a professional musician at one point. And that lifestyle and those types of things do tend to go with um, that industry quite a, a lot. More often than you might say people in the health movement. And um, while I have nothing against people that choose to use it, um, I had very negative effects with it. Um, I'm not going to go into those here. I did do a video once in the past about uh, my own past health. And marijuana was actually a very major cause for a lot of problems I went through at the end of, um, I guess, early adulthood or end of my teens. And in terms of the amount I was using it then, it's really hard to say. It was varying. It really depended on whether I had some or not <laughs> available. And you were saying in what form, and that was just sort of your typical smoking it. Now, what I would say about marijuana is if you are going to be using this illegal substance, I would highly encourage you to think about the effects of burning plant material and taking that into your lungs. Over the long term, it's going to have negative effects in terms of the carcinogenic properties of burnt plant material. Um, now, a lot of people talk about the medicinal and anti-cancer effects of marijuana. However, it's hard to say what the difference is there in terms of large amounts of the carcinogens in one concentrated spot. So while you might have anti-cancer properties happening in other parts of your body, it's quite hard on the lungs. And so of course I'd highly recommend if you insist on using this substance to use a vaporizer. Now one other big concern I have with its use, and I believe this really affected me quite a bit more than any other aspect to it, is the effect it has on your neurotransmitters. Specifically, um, it's going to drastically lower your ability of your own body to make dopamine. And there's two neurotransmitters that work in harmony and in balance in your brain, and that's dopamine and serotonin. Um, people are familiar with serotonin being the neurotransmitter that gives you good moods. And when it's low, it's said to be the cause of depression. And dopamine is very much tied into the serotonin levels. And if dopamine gets too high, serotonin can get too low. If dopamine gets too low, serotonin can get high. But also they can both crash. And in many cases where one is very depressed, the other one will come down too. Now, dopamine is released in the brain through marijuana's use. So when you're triggering large dumps of this chemical into your bloodstream, uh, as well as serotonin, you're going to be hampering your body's ability to create it on its own and to dump it on its own. And you're going to be relying on that substance to cause that effect in your body. Now the other aspect to dopamine being so depressed with its usage is the high amounts of phytoestrogen in marijuana. And this is actually in the flowering buds of all the hemp plants. So this is also true with hemp, the actual plant that's not illegal, at least not in Canada. And the plant is related to another plant that is a potent phytoestrogen known as hops. So hops is used in beer, and it's prevalent in pretty much all the beer that's commercially available. And it's so such a potent phytoestrogen that um, 
women or young girls that would pick it in the fields in days gone by, when it was collected for whatever use, um, they could actually come on the periods prematurely just through absorbing the phytoestrogens through the skin. So this is plant chemicals that mimic estrogen in the body. Very depressing to dopamine, which is sort of tends to be higher in man, men because it's got a relationship with testosterone and gives humans that drive to accomplish things and to strive and to be productive. So that characteristic low drive um, inability to manifest things in the physical world, which can be said to be a characteristic of marijuana users, um, is hampered uh, from the phytoestrogen aspects of this plant. Now the next question I got from Marco on Facebook, and he was asking a few different qu questions around uh, ginseng, and I just wanted to share my thoughts around this online as well. So ginsengs, there's a variety of different types, and some are fall into the specific category of Panax, which is uh, the ginseng family, and others are just so similar, but yet botanically not quite in the same family, but are related, that they're also considered ginseng, or given the name ginseng. So the three main types of ginseng that are actually fall into the family are Chinese ginseng, Korean ginseng, and American ginseng. And Chinese and Korean are both warming, in fact, Korean can be hot, and also the way ginseng is prepared, it can be considered hot, meaning it's very young, very fiery. And this can be a bit intense for some people, yet it is necessary for some people if they are requiring that, and it's a chi tonic. And the American ginseng, on the other hand, is very cooling. But I also want to add that American ginseng is a phytoestrogen as well. Well, it's not as high as these other things I've been talking about, or some of these uh, high phytoestrogen foods like flax or soy. But it's a mild phytoestrogen that you have to keep in mind if you're uh, striving to be on a low phytoestrogen diet. Now in terms of the grading of ginsengs, there's a vast market for them and so there's a vast level of quality. Now of course the stuff you find at your local gas station and the little red vials that you take a hit of, that's nothing better than caffeine pills. It's very harsh stimulating. Probably very unlikely that the roots used in those little capsules are even more than one or two years old. I could be wrong on that but it seems to me their quality is very low. Definitely not organic definitely going to be um, harsher on the system in terms of its effects than being beneficial for your health. It's more of a wake-up thing that might be a little bit better than taking caffeine pills, but it's uh, definitely to be avoided. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you can spend as much as $10,000 on a single ginseng root. And this is because if you take into account that ginseng has been the most highly prized root or herb in all of Chinese medicine, people have developed almost a connoisseurial type of approach to utilizing it. So a wild ginseng is always going to be much more expensive than a cultivated form. And there's sort of a transitional cultivated wild ginseng when they actually take roots and put them out in the wild, but they tend to them and they go back and forth to them and make sure they're not getting eaten by animals. And then there's also age of roots, so the older a root is, the more valuable it is, and ginseng roots can get up to be 200 years old. That's quite interesting for a plant that doesn't really get very large in terms of once it's reached maybe age 7. It's Generally, that's the size it's going to be, but it can stay that size and be in the soil for a very, very long time. It's not quite totally understood what the maximal age span is possible for ginseng, but definitely the older roots are going to have more shen type qualities in terms of raising your spiritual vibration, you could say, and they're going to be better for enhancing longevity, and they're also going to be very costly. Now again, some of the Chinese ginsengs that are the most expensive are in grown in radioactive soil. It's slightly radioactive. I'm not talking about like dangerously radioactive, but there's properties in the soil that can be measured with a radiometer that in, for some reason is beneficial to the increase in the ginsenocides in the root, making it um, better for you. So I personally enjoy ginseng. It's not recommended to take it daily if you're under the age of 40. And if you're younger than 18, 19, 20, it's probably recommended not to take it much at all. You could maybe sample it here and there, but it's got an effect of boosting testosterone and you don't want to throw your own body's production of that hormone out of balance. But if you feel drawn to sampling it or using it on a regular basis, I recommend uh, starting out with a 
very good quality ginseng, such as the one that Brandon Damon is now carrying on his site, HyperionHerbs.com. You can find that link below. And it's a white Chinese ginseng. And these are, in my opinion, the best type of ginseng because it's not too hot like the Korean. It's not going to be so cool and uh, estrogenic like the American ginseng. And it's really good for that person just wanting that enhanced digestion, enhanced chi functions of the body and to just feel more vibrant overall because the root of the ginseng plant in the right conditions will actually form and look like the body of a human being so it's a whole body tonic we could talk about all the specific functions of it but really it is beneficial for the whole being and that's the key principle behind a good tonic herb so I'll ask questions through the week I'll talk to you later take care and embrace life without limits